Um, uh, this panel is, you know, uh, quite special for me. I'm privileged to be uh, here with you. Um, I hope that we will address regional and international cooperation. Uh, we have distinguished panelists from different perspectives. Uh, we will go through, uh, you know, a lot of interventions, whether from a perspective of regional cooperation, uh, you know, bilateral cooperation, multilateral cooperations. Uh, we will try to highlight uh, during this panel the importance of partnership, uh, the different mechanisms that already exist in Africa. Uh, opportunities and definitely uh, I think we look forward to more participation based on uh, the outcome of not just of this panel but the whole event and uh, following events. Uh, let me start by introducing uh, my dear friend and colleague uh, uh, Mr. Adel Suleiman from the African Union Commission. Uh, we have been working uh, together over the past uh, few years on the agenda for cybersecurity in Africa within the framework of the African Union. Uh, Adel, you have the floor. You are muted. Please unmute yourself. Mm, sorry. Um... Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sharif. Um, I'm really honored to be here with you guys. Um, uh, as Sharif mentioned, uh, I think we've been collaborating uh, for the last few years, and I think this is a very good opportunity to uh, foster and strengthen this um, international and regional cooperation uh, in cyberspace. So uh, um, I, uh, I, my name is Adam Suleiman, as mentioned by Dr. Sharif. Uh, I am a senior policy officer within the African Union Commission. And the African Union Commission uh, has its um, 2063 agenda and aspirations. And as well as also, we are taking also note of the UN agenda uh, 2030. And I think uh, we uh, concluded that in order to uh, realize those uh, aspirations, we need to leverage uh, uh, digitalization. And I think for us, uh, digitalization is a top priority. Uh, in fact, uh, we, uh, in 2020, we adopted a digital transformation strategy for Africa, 2020, 2030. Uh, and I think this is a multi-sectorial strategy. And we, in fact, we are also now developing sectorial strategy for agriculture, for education, and for health uh, and uh, commerce, et cetera, et cetera. So, and uh, as well as also, uh, if you, uh, maybe you are aware that the African Union also is uh, also adopting um, the uh, continental free trade area. So I think the stakes are high for the African Union when it comes to digital. And, and this is where cybersecurity, personal data protection becomes a critical element in this equation. And the African Union, uh, uh, because of that, uh, we have cybersecurity as one of our flagship projects uh, uh, for the commission. And uh, I think um, uh, several actions uh, were taken by the African Union Commission to make sure that, of course, we have all this um, uh, initiative taken place on digital, but we need to make sure that, um, you know, we have a safe and trusted environment. And I think for that, we are, we are, we are trying our best to, to, to make sure that uh, the trust is there within the community, the African community, as well as uh, 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 within uh, in the region and also globally. Uh, so several initiatives that the African Union Commission has taken, I think uh, we uh, developed uh, the uh, cybersecurity uh, convention, uh, the African Union Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection. And uh, uh, it's not yet uh, entered into force. We have 10 countries who ratified the convention. We are still missing uh, five more countries. And I think this is an opportunity for uh, representatives from the African countries to work with us in order uh, to make sure that the convention enter into force because having a legal uh, framework, I think this is one step to, uh, for digital cooperation so that we speak the same language uh, 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 on the continent. And um, a, uh, also we have been cooperating with also the uh, Council of Europe uh, and, and uh, uh, every two years we organize the cyber crime forum. I think this one, the last one uh, was done in June, 2021. I think some of you attended the forum uh, and thank you for, all, for your participation and, 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 and uh, input to the forum. 
We are also working with GFC, uh, the GFC uh, Global uh, uh, Forum for Cyber Expertise. I think we're working with them uh, for some time. And in 2019, in fact, we organized the first African, uh, the first uh, Africa located uh, forum. Uh, and um, I think we was, uh, it was a big event because not only uh, it was a GFC uh, annual meeting, but also there was um, a UNGG representative, the ambassadors, uh, and also the open-ended group uh, they were there and there were some consultations. And I think it was very fruitful discussion. I think out of this, uh, we were, now we are in, uh, implementing with GFC a capacity building initiative uh, uh, for Africa. Um, and um, also in tandem, just to make sure that um, Africa has the best advice uh, uh, there because you know, uh, our team is, is not uh, big in the African Union Commission. So what we did, we established the African Union uh, Cybersecurity Expert Group. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to say that Sharif is one of our uh, leading um, experts in the group. Uh, so I think the expert group uh, has been uh, of great help. And uh, we also, uh, when, when we talk about uh, uh, digital cooperation, we also, they are also active uh, in the UN processes. And I think this is, uh, gives us an advantage because sometimes within the African Union Commission, there may be a conflict uh, in terms of scheduling. So we have them uh, attending this, uh, and some of them were actually members of the GGE, uh, and, and as well, they've been also constantly uh, attending the, um, uh, the uh, open-ended uh, and, and, and working group and provided, providing to us some advice uh, uh, on cyber-related issues. And I think we, we see that as a, a very um, uh, important step that we have taken in 2019. And I think we've been working and we continue Working. I think some of the fruit of this uh, effort is that uh, together with the um, uh, African Union Cybersecurity Expert Group, we were able to develop a, um, a child online policy for Africa. It's a draft, but it's still, I think we are going now to the next phases of the draft. We have, uh, we will have some consultation with uh, um, regional stakeholders, but eventually we'll go out to the uh, member state and will be adopted uh, by the um, uh, AU organs. We also uh, looked at the Malabo Convention because uh, we saw that uh, countries, um, we don't have the uh, enough ratification. So we thought maybe we have to take um, a proactive measure to look at the Malabo Convention and see where it can be improved uh, uh, in the event that the Malabo Convention uh, is ratified, is fully ratified, then we can introduce some of this amendment to the convention so that it gives more countries uh, comfort to ratify the convention. Um, uh, also, uh, we are working now on the uh, uh, continental cybersecurity strategy for Africa. And I think this is a huge undertaking, but I think we are, uh, we are also having task force uh, 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 working group uh, on that. And we hope uh, by 2022, sometime in 2022, we will be able to, uh, to, to have the draft uh, uh, the uh, strategy uh, and, and also going through AU process uh, for adoption. Um, uh, I, I don't want to take a lot of time, but also we have been cooperating with um, uh, some regional actors uh, where we, uh, for instance, with the European Union Commission, we have this initiative called FRIDA Policy and Regulation Initiative for Digital Africa, where we are doing um, uh, several things uh, on digital to prepare uh, you know, the groundwork for uh, the digital Africa and eventually the uh, single market for Africa, digital single market for Africa. And as I mentioned, now cyber becomes very critical because we are doing all this initiative. And uh, if we don't have trust within the continent and we don't have confidence, uh, then, uh, then these initiatives are doomed to fail. So I think this is why uh, cyber security becomes a critical component. I will stop here and, and I'll be glad to take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adil. Uh, I really appreciate you sharing with us uh, quite a few points. Uh, we'll get back to discuss them uh, during the intervention. After uh, we have, we take the, the, I mean, another two interventions from distinguished panelists. So uh, let me introduce my, uh, the second panelist. 
uh, Mr. Serge uh, Zongo from the uh, International Telecommunication Union. The ITU has done quite a bit when it comes to information technology at the international level. Of course, we all relate to the WS, the world, uh, you know, uh, high level, a distinguished event, WSIS, that actually it was in Geneva and then in Tunisia as well. Um, in uh, 2003, 2005, and from there on, the ITU was the champion uh, organization within the UN system when it comes to cybersecurity. Uh, Serge, it's a pleasure having you with us. Uh, um, Serge is a program manager at, um, at the ITU, and, and we look forward uh, to your uh, comments and intervention, and uh, uh, also thoughts about uh, international and regional cooperations. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sharif. Uh, good afternoon to all. Good morning uh, from where you are connected. Um, as I said, my name is Serge Valerie Zongo, and I'm a program, of, program officer at ITU uh, and uh, also uh, managing um, all ITU cybersecurity activities in the continent. And it's a very clear pleasure for us to uh, be part of this gathering that for us is very important to um, um, enhance the cooperation and also find some synergies for all the stakeholders or the rest ecosystem in the continent to make sure that we are, um, let's say, acting on the an efficient way. Um, as you know, the cybersecurity portfolio program in ITU is very broad, uh, but today I will just um, um, focus on what we are doing really on the third uh, on the third area. Uh, and uh, we we still uh, we still updating our approach to assist the countries uh, because I think that we can agree that uh, we are facing challenges in the continent. Uh, we have lack of uh, local expertise and original structure in cybersecurity. We have lack of skills to respond and manage cybersecurity incidents. Um, we are challenging when we are challenging when uh, we need to really have deep and uh, impactful cross development, even if we have some uh, funds available. Um, and lastly, we have lack of trust and confidence in ICT in ICT adoptions. And to address these challenges, uh, we are trying to um, keep. Um, adjusting our third program to really stock take the current incident response capabilities in the continent to establish um, organizational structures um, to uh, improve the development in incident response in the continent and um, also enhance the information dissemination and also the stakeholders' engagement going through awareness creation and promoting. Um, really, the cooperation, and to do so, we 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 are we are, we in ITU we develop a kind of what we call ITU self framework that really based on the services framework that first is promoting and also on, uh, adjusting on the needs of our member states, um, and this framework started by the self assessment where we really um, assessing the readiness of an of the country to establish national cert, but also more importantly, preparing the relevant, uh, relevant stakeholders and needed involvement for them to get to a success uh, cert implemented. And from, from this assessment, where we're developing the, the design document, agree design document, and from there we are going to establishment and enhancement phase of the of the of the cert. And really why we are developing this framework is really to explain how, what our approach is, our approach to prevent search. Um, we started implementing search in the continent since 2011, I think. And uh, we realized that we need really to um, keep adjusting the approach to make more sustainable the search. And uh, so this framework is really to um, fix this issue and also um, to present clearly the structure on how the project is faced and also to clarify the scope and responsibilities and efforts to make sure that the software implementing is uh, able to act as first and central production point in the country of at the region or 
in the country, national or region level, and to be able to identify and defend, respond to and manage the, the, the threats. So as I was saying, um, we um, so far um, did about 36 assessments of countries in the, in, in the continent. And um, we established about 11 thirds. And uh, we are now finalizing, uh, let's say, we just finalized Gambia and we are implementing Burundi and Malawi. And uh, we are assisting Kenya, for instance, to enhance the, the existing cert and at communication authority. Um, the new approach that we have also in the search is really to talk to the stakeholders in the continent that to see where we can find some synergies and put together the resources so we can build some more, uh, let's say, powerful, impactful search on the continent, on, on the countries. And for instance, for Burundi, we have some discussion with them for some um, World Bank. Uh, we have, for instance, uh, in, uh, in um, some countries, uh, for instance, uh, Chad and, uh, and uh, Eswatini, we have interaction with some other part partners where we just can't, where we, where we, we, we are um, looking for the, the way to find some uh, synergy where we can complete each other to make for more impactful serves. Uh, I will uh, conclude by talking about the cyber drills that uh, we are running um, since 2014. Um, we um, uh, conducted more than 30 exercises and for more than 100 countries. And in Africa, we have, we had the survey drills in Zambia, Rwanda, Mauritius, Tanzania, Cote d'Ivoire, and Uganda. And what we are really promoting during this survey drills is the collaboration, the um, partnership between the third and the country so they can create a kind of channel of discussion and knowledge sharing to make sure that the third that we have in the continent are really talking to each other, to are sharing expertise, to be more efficient when it comes to dealing with the separate incidents in the, in the continent. And we, um, this, because of the COVID, we had um, this to last year global cyber drill. Um, but next year, we're looking, really looking forward to have regional cyber drill for Africa. We're still looking for the host country, but it's something we plan uh, very soon. And for 2021, we, we had a regional cyber drill for Western Africa, ECOWAS. And next week, we're having the regional cyber drill for um, SADEC. And uh, I think the second select player is the one who is invited the participant and it's good that uh, you also attend to see what's going on, on, on this survey the race. So um, to conclude, I will just call upon um, really more coordination and synergies for a better use of available resources in the continent, because we have so much, we need to just need to make sure we are using them in a better way. I will call, I will, I want, I will want, I want to call also on innovation ways of funding CERT for better sustainability. I think that uh, we got, uh, when we are doing the survey for ECOWAS, a good example of Togo. I saw that our colleague from Togo is there. Um, I think it will be sharing with us this really um, brilliant and, and good initiative. Um, I also um, call for more collaboration and close sharing between CERT in Africa. Is something we need to improve really to make sure that we have this knowledge platform that really learning smoothly. And lastly, to create and improve a strong cybersecurity industry in the continent. This will conclude my remarks for this moment. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Serge, for sharing with us, uh, you know, quite a broad spectrum of activities within the ITU. Uh, if you allow me also, I'll, I'll get back to some of the other activities in addition, of course, to addressing your points. Uh, you highlighted the, the, I mean, the importance of networking cooperation, how the ITU is taking a central role when it comes to cyber drills uh, and uh, how to build, you know, this type of continuous effort of sustaining certs and, and uh, leading the, you know, the models for cert and the frameworks and at the same time implementing it on the ground, making sure that they are built to be sustained 
uh, and uh, how to network uh, you know partners uh, within africa and this is key to the discussion that will come later on uh, um, i'd like to pass the floor now to uh, my dear colleague and friend uh, engineer badr al salhi he has been a really instrumental at all levels at the i mean the uh, regional, uh, the Arab regional uh, uh, level. Uh, he is uh, leading in his home country, uh, Oman. Um, Oman has a very high rank when it comes to cybersecurity readiness in the global uh, index. Um, uh, I mean, uh, drafted and uh, you know re revisited every couple of years by the ITU. Uh, he is also leading in the Gulf area uh, between the Swiss and the Gulf area. In the Arab region, uh, Oman is hosting the Arab Regional uh, Cybersecurity Center, and they have a distinguished you know, uh, event. And more recently, uh, he has also assumed uh, the chairmanship of the uh, OIC, the Organization of Islamic Countries, CERT. Uh, and, and that's an organization that has you know, uh, quite a few very active players across a broad region uh, of Islamic countries. So I'd like to, I, I really look forward to uh, engineer Bad, uh, you know, uh, sharing with us uh, all at all levels, whether at the level of, you know, the OIC, the Arab region, the Gulf area, as well as in Oman, uh, the type of lessons and experiences that they have came across uh, especially when it, it involves regional and international partnerships and how it impacts, you know, cybersecurity readiness and incident response. Engineer Bad, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sharif. I hope you can hear me well. Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Excellent. So thank you very much again. Uh, thank you to first uh, Africa CERT and Tunis CERT as a representative, a member of OIC CERT for having me today with you. Uh, I'm gonna actually address uh, the regional and international cybersecurity initiatives. In Oman, uh, as Dr. Sharif uh, mentioned, uh, probably we were fortunate to wear multiple hats when it comes to cybersecurity initiatives on a GCC level, OIC, uh, CERT level, as well as uh, uh, through the ITU Arab Regional Cybersecurity Center that uh, we host in Oman. And, uh, we extend the, the services and the support to the rest of ITU member countries in cybersecurity. So in uh, such a short uh, time uh, that is allocated for this session, I'll just uh, address a few high-level initiatives outlining uh, uh, what is happening in the region. And this is on the aspect of cybersecurity strategies, capacity building, incident and threat management, as well as cybersecurity innovation uh, as well as uh, the role of women in cybersecurity, where we are also uh, having a number of initiatives supporting that. Uh, so on an OIC level, uh, three important initiatives uh, that uh, we have introduced. As uh, Dr. Sharif mentioned, that uh, OIC is quite actually a large organization. It is considered to be the second largest organization after United Nations with 57 member countries. And we were glad to have active members and board members like Egypt, where Dr. Sharif come from. So one of those uh, global initiatives we introduced within the YC CERT is the Global SEA Certification Program, which is actually a holistic framework of cybersecurity professional certification that outlines the overall approach, independent assessment, impartial of examination, competences of trainers, identification and classification of cybersecurity domains, and the requirement of professional memberships. Uh, the recent uh, global initiatives that we also introduced was the Global Cybersecurity Award, which is basically one of OIC CERT initiatives to encourage international collaboration in the domain of cybersecurity. The award recognizes innovative cybersecurity projects from around the world, uh, not being bounded by country or region, uh, that contributes to uplifting uh, the cybersecurity globally. The theme for this year was cybersecurity innovation towards society, prosperity, and well-being. Uh, and we have announced actually the winners of this award, which is uh, it, it includes also a financial award to incentivize uh, more members actually to contribute to this program. And the winners were announced during the recent OIC CERT annual conference. Uh, 
Uh, the OIC annual cyber drill is an opportunity for not only the certs within the OIC cert member countries, uh, but also it's been extended to other regional platforms uh, that we collaborate with, including Paris, uh, Africa Service, the AP CERT, and others, basically to have teams participating. And this is, uh, uh, again, uh, in line with uh, the cyber drills that are actually developed and implemented by ITU for different regions. Uh, on the GCC CERT level, which is uh, six uh, countries, as you are aware, uh, we have actually uh, established a cybersecurity strategy with a detailed business plan that is updated every two years. But two main projects and initiatives on the GCC level, one was the GCC malware information sharing platform and the threat intelligence sharing platform that has been made available to all GCC countries to actually share uh, information on related threats, uh, malware incidents that they are experiencing, allowing other countries to be more proactive towards addressing such threats before they become a target of it. Uh, on the regional level and through the ITU Regional Cybersecurity Center, uh, actually we uh, annually conduct a regional cybersecurity week that has multiple events, including a conference as well as a regional cyber drill. Uh, but annually also we run a regional uh, capture the flag competition. This is not only being made available to national certs, but also targeting youth in the Arab region where we believe uh, youth uh, actually uh, co considers to be uh, the largest uh, probably part of the population in the Arab region. And we have been witnessing a good number of innovative projects coming from the region, as well as good talents when it comes to uh, threats hunting and uh, uh, identifying vulnerabilities within running application and systems. And I mentioned in my earlier introduction that we do also support an in a regional initiatives that it's called Women in Cybersecurity Middle East which uh, actually addresses uh, the needs uh, in this domain to bring more female. Uh, we have probably quite a lack in that in the region, and we thought of uh, having uh, dedicated initiatives to ensure that capacity building are also built within the female community, and we were fortunate actually to have a number of cybersecurity leaders now in the uh, GCC level that are women considering my deputy. Uh, also the regional center, and this is we appreciate the trust giving by ITU. Oman has been selected to host the first uh, ITU regional cybersecurity center that is extending its uh, support and services to the 193 member countries of the ITU uh, after it started only with the Arab region. And uh, we have been actually running uh, around 170 plus projects and initiatives within the region that varies between developing cybersecurity strategies uh, for cybersecurity, but there are dedicated cybersecurity strategies for, online, for child online protection, which we did in Bahrain. We have participated also with ITU in a number of regional cybersecurity development workshop for uh, the Asia region, for the Arab region, as well as for East Europe region. Uh, technical assessment uh, has been provided uh, to a number of countries as well as actually the incident management. We have uh, recently concluded the uh, establishment of Palestine CERT where we have actually supported the, the country of Palestine to establish their uh, national CERTs and we are working with other countries also in the region to ensure that uh, national CERT at least are established when it comes to capacity building. We all believe that humans as well, uh, as they are actually the weakest link, but there are also the one we count on when it comes to cybersecurity. So we have actually run a good number of uh, cybersecurity trainings and workshops uh, around 86 plus. Uh, additionally, we work certainly with the regional and other international organizations like FAIRST, where we were actually uh, privileged to have an MOU signed with FAIRST a few years back, and based on that, we had run a joint symposium and workshop. We started in Egypt in 2016, thanks to Dr. Sharif. Uh, at that time, he was leading the Egypt CERT, uh, one of the successful events we did with FAIRST, followed by another symposium uh, in uh, Dar es Salaam, as well as in Tunisia. And uh, basically, today's 
also event uh, in cooperation with Tunis CERT uh, that is also a member of the OIC. So we believe that uh, having such regional initiatives will maximize the value brought uh, to the cybersecurity community. Uh, and uh, it is an opportunity to share knowledge, experiences, and uh, actually to enable more uh, collaboration across countries and overcome uh, the reinvent the wheel concept. And uh, I would support Serge in his concluding remark that we do really uh, encourage more of this collaboration and we look forward to such joint events that will enable every participant to understand what is going on in every region. And then we decide how we can make the best out of it to benefit the entire community to make the world a safe cyberspace. With that, I will conclude my remark. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, uh, Engineer Badr. It has been really a pleasure uh, cooperating with uh, with you in different capacities, but I'm really uh, especially happy for you, uh, your presence with us today. I think you shared with us quite a few modalities, whether at the level of the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Countries, uh, and that's one dimension. The other dimension, uh, I mean, sub-regional activities like the one that you shared about the Gulf cooperation uh, countries, uh, GCC, CERT, and uh, having you know uh, some synergy when it comes to creating a strategy and pushing the strategy forward. And finally, with the, the Center of Excellence that, that you host in Oman, uh, the Arab uh, Regional Center of Excellence of the ITU, it's supported by the ITU, uh, and that you extended that. And I'm really impressed to see 170 plus projects. That's a lot of activities. And uh, it really reflects back on you know uh, how the leadership uh, at all levels can have a significant impact in the development um, again it's it's one one of the attributes that we're looking for, for uh, during our panel discussion today we'll get back to uh, you know some of the details thanks for being with us um, uh, let us uh, move quickly to uh, our you know, um, uh, final, you know, panelist uh, uh, within the first section of this panel. Uh, we decided to split the panel first, uh, four speakers, then we take some questions from the floor, uh, and then we move uh, with the rest of the panelists. Thank you all for being patient with us. And I think now I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Elizabeth uh, Vish from the US State Department. Um, I look forward to your talk, uh, uh, especially when the, when it comes to the U.S. Uh, State Department's uh, involvement in Africa, being a partner country um, throughout. And also, I would like to hear from you on a different topic, if you have time, uh, to address the uh, the efforts that the U.S. is leading uh, with other, you know, uh, countries across the globe uh, within the U.N. Uh, system, the U.N. Uh, open-ended working group and uh, gr I mean group of governmental experts and this has been an effort ongoing for several years. We are fortunate to have a few countries being members of the uh, UNGGE and being active on the uh, you know, uh, UN open-ended working group from the Africa and the Arab region. Uh, so uh, the floor is yours Elizabeth. Please go ahead. Great, thank you so much. Um, it is a real pleasure to be with you today. Um, I think following the excellent presentations that have already happened, I'm going to be brief and then as people have questions, I'm happy to address them. Um, but I think we've heard really great work that's ongoing on the continent and in the region. Um, and it's wonderful to be, I'm, I'm honored to be on the panel. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I'll, I'll just start briefly by talking a little bit about the U.S.'s commitment. So first of all, the U.S. is committed to strengthening global cyber capacity build capacity to protect and promote an open, interoperable, and secure and reliable internet. Open, interoperable, reliable, and secure. Those are the ways, the words that we use to describe the internet that we're seeking. Um, as Vice President Harris said in Paris in November, the United States is committed to working to advance security in cyberspace, to promote stability in cyberspace, and to ensure, ensure shared prosperity. So this includes our continued partnerships with governments, private sector, civil society, and the technical community around the world to advance cybersecurity partners' capacity on a range of cyber issues. For more than a decade, the Department of State has leveraged diplomatic engagement and foreign assistance to help our partner nations develop strong cyber capacity. 
since 2012, actually, we've been directly involved um, in capacity building in the Middle East and Africa. Our very first whole of government training for partners was in Accra, Ghana, in collaboration with ECOWAS, and uh, we haven't stopped running since. Um, our capacity building work covers five major themes. First, we assist governments to develop and implement national cyber strategies and effective whole of government approaches to policies relating to cyberspace, so national strategies. Second, we work to strengthen national incident management capabilities and protect critical infrastructure. So that's primarily been our work with CSERTs um, that we've sponsored with SEI. Third, we work to combat cybercrime through the promoting the Budapest Convention and providing practical legal training. And I'm not the one who usually does that. That's my colleagues who have um, experience in law enforcement issues. Um, fourth, we work to promote uh, private public sector collaboration, including on things like cybersecurity standards. And finally, we work to build a culture of cybersecurity through awareness and workforce development. Um, and in Africa and the Middle East, we've primarily worked on the first three of those topics. Um, we've worked with, uh, 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 sponsored a, a group called the MITRE Corporation to help a few governments and um, groups in, in regional organizations. And this is what um, Adil was talking about. Um, in 2018, for example, we joined an event that the African Union convened, and we brought some experts to talk about drafting national cyber strategies. Um, and then we've done a fair amount with the Software Engineering Institute, and the good news is that you're going to hear from Justin directly, I think, later on in the program about the work that they're doing. Um, and, uh, you know, we've, been, we've also convened some re regional trainings fo focused on risk-based based approaches to cybersecurity. So think about your cybersecurity, not from a technical perspective, but from a, a whole holistic perspective. And you're gonna hear a little bit about those approaches, I think later on. Um, and we've also, so in addition to our capacity building, we've engaged partners in the Middle East and Africa on issues of international security in cyberspace, including raising awareness of the framework of responsible state behavior in cyberspace. And this is uh, what Dr. Sharif was talking about. Um, there have been a round of negotiations at the United Nations that uh, he participated in at one point. Um, there have been, I think, five or six group of governmental experts uh, where select governments uh, from across the world, self-nominated governments uh, from across the world, sent an expert to negotiate at the United Nations about uh, work that we could do together to reduce the risk of conflict in cyberspace. In addition to that, um, beginning in 2019, there uh, was an open-ended working group also convened by the United Nations, also under the work that they do focused on disarmament and peace. Um, and that open-ended working group was open to all. And uh, in this spring, both uh, the current GGE and uh, that open-ended working group is open to all, the open-ended working group is open to all UN member states. So if you, if, all governments that are members of the UN were invited and encouraged to participate in those negotiations, whereas the GGE is, is select, select governments to nominate an expert. And so they're kind of um, complementary tracks, you might think. Um, both of those had a negotiation round that concluded in this spring, and they affirmed three things, uh, as well as I, uh, what I think of as an underlying, um, underlying support. Um, the, they affirmed a framework of responsible state behavior in cyberspace, that includes an affirmation that international law that exists already, uh, things like the UN Charter, apply to uh, the activities that governments do in cyberspace. Secondly, they affirmed a list of norms of responsible state behavior that good governments operating in good faith should do these things or should not do these things in peacetime. These are voluntary, but they sort of outline um, the rules of the road. Uh, the things that are uh, good behavior or not, are not good behavior. Um, and then the third piece of the framework that has been affirmed multiple times, including this last spring, is uh, the value of practical confidence building measures. So um, things as basic as exchanging points of contact so that if there's an incident of, of concern, uh, governments can reach out to one another and know who, who to reach out to. Um, and I bring this up uh, in part because, uh, in part because uh, there's a specific norm of responsible state behavior in cyberspace that relates to the work of CSERTs. And I'm gonna read it, it's in Diplo speak, so then I'll kind of explain it a little bit. Um, 
but the the norm it was first outlined in 2015 and it has subsequently been reaffirmed both at the open-ended working group so all UN member states and also um, at the most recent UN group of governmental experts and the norm says states should not knowingly or cannot should not conduct or knowingly support activities to harm the information systems of the authorized emergency response teams sometimes known as computer emergency response teams or cybersecurity incident response teams of another state. A state should not use an authorized emergency response team to engage in malicious international activity. So this is what we call a norm of restraint. Uh, this is a norm where governments that have signed up to it have said, we're not gonna use our certs to do bad things, to cause trouble, to uh, you know, conduct malicious activity. We are gonna, recognize that CSERTs have a special role to play. Um, this norm is a recognition that the United States and the broader international community have identified the role of CSERTs as essential and deserving of protection. In fact, many states categorize CSERTs as part of their critical infrastructure. And the norm recognizes the importance of protecting CSERTs when they are providing incident response and network defense services to the public. And, and I'd also note that if CSERTs do engage in malicious international activity, they wouldn't be eligible for protection under the norm, right? It's a, it's a norm of mutual commitment. Um, I realize I'm probably running out of time. So I uh, will, will, you know, I will just say that our capacity building efforts internationally and in the region um, are generally in line with supporting this framework. Um, they're always in line with supporting this framework. Um, and sometimes they're directly about, you know, engaging people's awareness of the framework. And um, sometimes they're about diving into specific pieces of the framework um, or just supporting cybersecurity capacity in part so that governments can commit to and, and, and follow the framework. Um, I want to be respectful of people's time. I'll just say that we do have some capacity building programs for CSERT that we're sponsoring the Software Engineering Institute to do in the region. Um, particularly, primarily in Africa. Um, and I'm also going to put in the chat uh, a little bit, a couple um, places that I would encourage all CSERTs to um, look to for information, particularly the US Department of Homeland Security um, offers uh, uh, subscription feeds for threat information. And I would encourage um, folks to sign up for that. And um, also, we have um, the Homeland Security Information Network, which is a nomination you must apply to be part of, but it can be a great way for your team to get information about threats that are timely um, and have them sort of automatically delivered to you. So uh, with that, I'll hand it back to the chair and I look forward to questions. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. You shared with us, uh, you know, uh, a, a lot of activities across different levels, uh, whether at the international level. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad that you highlighted, I was counting on you to highlight, you know, the links between the norms of responsible state behavior and the confidence building measures that are developed, have been developed over the past, uh, you know, over 10, 12 years at the UN level, they are adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations. So that's the broadest group of, a group of adoption, really, and it provides an umbrella. And reflecting back to uh, our colleagues working here and, you know, at different CERT uh, incident handlers, uh, there is, a, you know, a special place for you to make them happen. Uh, talking about norms, it happens, uh, and, and uh, confidence building measures, it happens at a high level where mostly, I mean, they are led by diplomats, uh, you know, government officials, uh, international lawyers, uh, experts, you know, uh, uh, you know, working with the UN at all levels. However, uh, they have already opened up, you know, with the open-ended working group to organizations. And first, were, was invited to be part of the organizations addressing the open-ended working group and communicating with the UNGGE, Group of Governmental Experts. In fact, uh, I, I know that when uh, I represented you know, Egypt, uh, uh, the UNGGE in 2012, 2013, I was the only representative from uh, Africa and the Middle East. And I lobbied to expand this. And thanks to the US and other partners, the UK, uh, uh, and most of the group uh, you know, endorsed you know, expanding that group and even opening up uh, uh, you know, the process to include uh, professional organizations like FIRST, 
and we were part of this. And currently we have a member of the organizing committee who is a current UNGGE member, and we have been invited to the open-ended working group as well. So uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to address this because there is something, a few points actually, that are quite relevant, not just one norm, all the CBMs about, about you know, building confidence ahead of time. You know, you don't build confidence during a crisis time. You build confidence ahead of a crisis. Hopefully no crisis, is, I mean, uh, you don't face a, a major crisis that would require, you know, international uh, interventions, but, uh, you know, day-to-day -day challenges that we face. Uh, uh, you mentioned uh, in your talk, uh, you know, Elizabeth, about, you know, the feeds that are provided uh, you know, to countries and uh, feeds about possible threats, uh, you know, attack vectors that are spreading. Um, so quite a few points that uh, we'll get back to. I'd like to open the floor for to take some questions. And uh, I have some questions of my own uh, to address, uh, uh, I mean, uh, to my colleagues uh, at different levels. Uh, um, maybe I, I'll start with general questions, but let's pause if, and see if we have questions from the floor first. Uh, unfortunately, my French is non-existent almost. So please, if you have questions for, for us, uh, I really appreciate it if they are in English. Um, so with this said, uh, let me start by, uh, you know, having uh, some few points maybe addressed. Uh, we were discussing now, let's, uh, you know, uh, move along the same lines of the international collaboration uh, with the process of the UNGGE, the open-ended working group. The African Union also uh, has uh, opened channels, different you know, scenarios for uh, you know, uh, discussing norms, uh, confidence building measures, uh, and also trying to have some synergy between African countries when it comes to adopting you know, the, the legal uh, framework, the regulatory framework uh, Adil, can you highlight, you know, the importance of, you know, this type of synergy and coordination that happens with, within uh, the African Union activities? Um, uh, so that, I mean, in Africa, we are aware of what's happening elsewhere. At the same time, we can reflect back uh, on our individual countries and uh, regional activities. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sharif. Uh, as you mentioned, there are so many things to go on cyber, and uh, I think, uh, getting the priority right, I think one of the, is one of the challenges. Um, uh, so um, uh, I think in, just in general, before I, I, I get to this question. So I think in general for the African Union Commission, the priorities are to help the countries. I think that we've been doing some work with the US uh, State Department to strategies. And I think we want to do that also at the regional level and at the continental level. And also, of course, we, know we want to raise awareness, develop capacity, and, and make sure that we have a legal framework. Um, uh, I think, uh, yes, I want to draw your attention that I think we had, a, uh, with the help of the US government, we had the, um, a, a regional consultation in the ECOWAS region recently, uh, where uh, we tried to uh, walk through the norms and see what is it that uh, African countries would, uh, would uh, kind of uh, take like priorities uh, when it comes to the African norms. So, because I think this, this uh, I think we have to be careful here because, uh, you know, we don't want to dictate uh, to the countries what to do, but I think we leave it up to the countries to decide what, it's, what is it that uh, they think it would be um, uh, an important element. So, so we are doing this, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we had the uh, GGE and open-ended working group, and, and uh, they spoke uh, at length on, about the uh, norms and, and confidence, confidence building measures. Uh, and uh, I think we are trying to work with also with the open-ended working group, the GGE, uh, to have regional consultations. Uh, and as we are doing with the US, we to have regional consultations so that, uh, you know, first of all, uh, you know, the uh, policymakers are kind of, uh, they are up to speed with all these norms and why they're important, because I think we need to sell that. Uh, I think we don't have yet the political will 
uh, across the board. Maybe it's here and there, but it's not across the board. So we need to make sure that we have this um, uh, awareness raising and, and consultations with the African countries. We, uh, we unfortunately, we did one, but uh, we didn't follow up with the uh, uh, GGE and open-ended working group. Uh, and we are looking forward. I think we are doing also some work with the GFC, but I, I, it's just an one-offs uh, and we need to make sure that we do this thing consistently so that the country understand this is a priority. This is something important. Uh, because uh, you know, trust and, 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 and confidence in ICT is very paramount for us to make sure that we um, are implementing our uh, priority when it comes to the uh, digital space. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adel, for sharing. Uh, I think this is uh, really quite useful for uh, all of us to, to keep in mind. It's quite a challenging task. and really having partnership uh, makes it uh, quite a bit uh, easier. Uh, I'd like to move to engineer uh, Badr and, and uh, really uh, our experience in, in Egypt and in the region, African region, Arab region, has been you know, the importance of building partnership and trust uh, starts at the, all levels. You have you know, annual events, you have uh, cyber drills. Uh, cyber drills are very special to me. Um, uh, in Egypt, we started off by, uh, you know, participating in the ITU cyber drills, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, whether it's the Arab region or the African region, uh, we also participated in the OIC cyber drills and Asia Pacific. Egypt is not Asia Pacific, but we got the partnership to work for us. Uh, this helps the teams to work together to gain trust at the operational level. What is your experience with uh, trying to build trust among, you know, uh, incident handlers uh, ahead of time, ahead of the need of, you know, uh, requiring coordination in time of a crisis? Yes, uh, Dr. Sharif, um, I think uh, being doing that for uh, several years now, and as uh, you mentioned, at different levels, uh, within the OIC, the GCC, the Arab countries, as well as we do actually national cyber drills also for the government and the critical infrastructure. We have actually realized that in addition to building the competences uh, for teams to be much ready and prepared to address cyber incident, it has enabled also the team to have uh, a one-to-one communication and a one-to-many communication with the other representative of national certs in the region that has enabled them to really have that convenient uh, to, to pick up the phone and talk to any colleague from a member country either to seek a help or support to address a specific incident or to share uh, an experience that they have uh, faced during an incident that they have addressed at their domestic level. So I have seen really quite significant improvement in the readiness uh, of the countries in the region uh, to address uh, cybersecurity threat and challenges. But it has also brought to our inten intention that uh, we should not only limit actually such uh, value to be only to the national certs, but we have also started engaging uh, specific uh, critical national infrastructure uh, sectors to the annual drills that we are participating, allowing them not only to participate actually in the drills, but to share with us their experiences where we have find there were quite good number actually of talents and competences within the critical national infrastructure that they were shit, willing also to share their uh, specific and special type of incidents that probably they have not been seen in other sectors with the rest of the other countries participating in the other regions. So I would say continuing with this will not only enable us actually to be in a better position to address cyber threats, but it enable us also to become uh, more proactive on uh, uh, assuring the trust in sharing information. Uh, it gives the convenience and the comfort uh, for uh, all countries in the region uh, to believe that information sharing is really powerful. Uh, we have seen a quiet challenges uh, using actually the word of confidentiality and sensitivity of information not to be shared with the, uh, other regions. But through these drills, I think everybody has witnessed that information sharing is actually helping individual countries, not only other countries that they are sharing the information with. So this is my kind of uh, 
findings over uh, the drills that we have done. And it also encourages us actually to uh, keep doing it in a way where it becomes also more innovative and uh, predictive to address uh, emerging threats with the fourth industrial uh, revolution and the application, application associated with it. I think now we are going to address more different challenges than we used to do. And we have also to consider that in our future cyber threats. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I really uh, uh, support your idea, especially during the COVID time, we have witnessed the global you know, uh, uh, transformation, uh, rapid transformation, if I may say, uh, towards digital uh, digitalization, whether it's in uh, one sector or across different sectors in Africa, especially. Uh, African countries relied on the ICT in ways that were really uh, only tapped upon you know, before the, the pandemic, but now it's everywhere in finance, in education, culture, exchange, uh, healthcare, of course, uh, industrial, um, uh, I mean, and, and work uh, environment. So there are lots of applications now than lo and many sectors. And I really appreciate also sharing that uh, you're now including the sectoral uh, certs and the instant handlers uh, in such activities. I'd like to move to a question that we got uh, to the ITU about the uh, I mean, again, along the lines of building capacity, human capacity, and you know, uh, a search address you addressed before, uh, you know, the, the lack of uh, talents within Africa, and this is really important for us to build. And I think many of the panelists also would share the same idea. Would you like to add something along these lines, sir? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sharif. Um, uh, to clarify a bit, let's see. The number, when we look in the figures, we are about 7,000 certified professionals in Africa with a population of about 140 billion. Does this mean that we really need to, um, let's say, improve and increase the number of professionals to be able to, uh, let's say, build this task force to defend and to uh, manage incidents uh, in the continent? Um, in ITU, we we really um, taking that uh, this capacity building, uh, capacity development uh, policies or strategies should normally be embedded on the national space space strategies. And you will see that, for instance, we just launched the the, the second edition of the cybersecurity strategy guide uh, that we developed with many um, stakeholders. Where we, are promote, where we are trying to promote within these national strategies, it, 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 it really plays, or uh, let's say, on the top priority of the, of the area to be addressed, the capacity development in the countries, where we make sure that we can, we can allocate the, 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 let's say, the appropriate resources uh, in the country or at a regional level to make sure that uh, this is something we can um, achieve and also monitor to make sure that we have we have built this capacity on the needed area on the on the region. So for us, um, the capacity development should be a part of the this strategies we are building in the our countries and make sure that we are monitoring them uh, accordingly and make sure that the resources that we are putting in place is really trying to build the capacity man, uh, in an efficient manner. So this is what I just want to uh, give us an uh, uh, idea. And I want to also um, come on what uh, Engineer Bada just said. Uh, it, this is something we really realize in that the, the cyber drills is also a way on building this kind of, um, let's say, uh, knowledge sharing and also the capacity of the countries that not only that don't have really some operational cert to be able or to be uh, uh, easily going to other people to look for expertise to deal with some issues that have in the countries. And this is something we really realize that is something that's improving the continent where we have one-to-one -one also, let's say, more group communication to be able to uh, address some incidents or challenges that we have in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Serge, for sharing with us. And uh, I, I strongly agree with you. Uh, it's very critical. I think all this panel so far has 
uh, have addressed, you know, capacity building. I'd like to end with a quick question to Elizabeth about, you know, you mentioned about the U.S. involvement in, in capacity building in Africa and across the globe, actually. Um, how important do you think uh, this is going to be on, on your agenda when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, you know, coming from Egypt, I always think about capacity building in terms of a pyramid. So you have, you know, the broad uh, base of the pyramid where you, uh, you have, you know, broad knowledge of cybersecurity across different you know professionals but when it approached to decision makers uh, at the top of the pyramid the the you know the high level uh, training of cyber uh, i mean cyber security professionals instant handlers uh, what type of uh, engagement uh, do you anticipate especially when it comes to operational uh, you know instant handling uh, this is, you know, uh, not something that you get from attending a class or a, a session, but it has to, to do with, you know, uh, engagement with uh, teams providing the services. Thanks. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a, a definitely a challenge. I would say that our I kind of think of this in in two in two levels. We are we are doing a range of capacity building that I think hopefully addresses everything from. Uh, you know, technical training to new CSERT staff, which we are funding the Software Engineering Institute to do, all the way up to, um, we have had a range of conversations that are focused on national cybersecurity strategies. And those, um, those, are, those, are, those are top level conversations, right? In an ideal scenario, a national cybersecurity strategy is drafted at the mid to senior level and then, uh, you know, approved by cabinet. Um, I, I would also say that I think a couple of people have raised the question of political will. Um, and political will is something that we, we struggle with in the United States. Um, we struggle with it uh, at, at, at the political level, our, our senior political leaders. We also struggle um, with uh, the private sector, having the awareness of the need to make cybersecurity a priority. And um, there's a, you know, the discussion of, is it a chief technical officer or a chief technology officer question, or is it a chief, um, chief operational question, or is it the CEO, right? Should it be the head of the company paying attention to cybersecurity? And obviously I, um, I and others at CISA um, really think that it should be a CEO question, not just a, a technology officer question. Um, and so we're, we're doing a lot, and this is, this is more domestically, but my colleagues are doing a lot to raise the profile of cybersecurity. And I think, frankly, we've gotten a lot more attention as we've had some very prominent cybersecurity incidents that have um, had da daily um, effects on people's daily lives, such as the shutdown, um, the, the ransomware attack that led the private company uh, Colonial Pipeline to shut down their pipeline transmitting uh, petroleum fuel uh, to a good chunk of the East Coast. So, and Sharif, you may have been impacted by that personally. Um, I live a little bit North, so I didn't have to put gasoline in, in, in plastic bags, which no one should ever do, but people did it because they were worried about getting access to gasoline. Um, and again, please don't ever put gasoline in, in, in plastic bags. That's a very bad idea. Um, but uh, it, does, it does illustrate how, you know, the one way to get political will is to have a really bad incident. And our, our hope is that the technical assistance we can provide can help raise the awareness of cybersecurity so that you can learn from our mistakes um, and, and get that senior level political will and get those private companies to understand the need to, to put this high on the agenda. Um, just in terms of what our, our, our work has done, we've, you know, we've, we've done a range of, of things. Um, I think one thing that I would draw your attention to is in 2019, um, before travel stopped, we convened a small group of um, some CSERTs on the continent, along with African Union Commission, uh, to talk about uh, exchange between CSERTs on the continent and exchange of information so that if a hack works in one country, um, you know, incident handlers in, in that country can uh, share with their, their neighbors at and appropriate steps can you know, be taken so that uh, government networks can defend themselves. Going back to the point about confidence building measures, I think those kinds of things are opportunities to build relationships that can then be relevant um, in, in the, when there is an incident. But I would also say that I think formal confidence building measures at the regional level um, or between individual governments or within regional economic communities um, can be a really beneficial way 
to not simply rely on those individual relationships built at conferences like this one, but also to um, help raise political will and raise awareness of the need for this. So, you know, a formal confidence building measure negotiated one country, one country to the other can be an opportunity for uh, the for a technical community or uh, a national ministry of communications, for example, to get um, buy-in from the, the president or from the minister to explain, you know, this is why we're building this formal confidence building measure. And we think out of this, we will be able to address incidents as they occur or if they were to occur. So wrap it all back up. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for sharing I mean, such really, uh, very important uh, comments. Also, you shared it in a, quite a diplomatic way, so we, we really appreciate that. With this, I'd like to thank uh, all the panelists so far that spoke, and um, we move to the next uh, you know, part of our panel. I'd like to uh, recognize that two of our panelists, uh, they were basically uh, engage in other activities and they, they took time to join us so if they want to leave please feel free to do that uh, thank you very much for your contribution and then we move to the next uh, uh, panelist um, let me start with uh, nick small from uh, cyber for dev um, uh, nick the floor is yours Great, thank you and uh, good day everybody. Um, let me start just uh, by uh, thanking our hosts for this event, which uh, I can see by the participant list is very well attended, which uh, um, is very encouraging. And uh, a quick shout out to uh, uh, the first team who have uh, organized the logistics of this so very well for us. Uh, um, this is, uh, I, I've, I've been lucky enough to be on a, another first event before, and I, I, I really appreciate uh, uh, the planning that goes into these. Um, I'd like to just spend a, a few minutes, uh, first of all, introducing uh, cyber, for, cyber Resilience for Development, which is an EU project uh, for which I am a regional coordinator focused on Africa. Um, and speak a little bit about what we do. And then um, I'd also like to come back to a few of the comments um, that have been made by um, some of the earlier panelists, which I thought were very uh, insightful and very relevant. Um, I'm going to uh, make take that faithful step of trying to share my screen. Um, and uh, let me do that very quickly. Um, so just as introduction, um, Cyber Resilience for Development is an EU-funded project um, that has been in operation for several years now um, with the goal of engaging with um, organizations, countries, regional entities um, around building cyber resilience and building cyber resilience for development. Uh, and I stress the word development, and I go back to Elizabeth's comments um, just a little bit er earlier. She used the point of uh, uh, shared prosperity, the shared prosperity that we can all gain uh, from the benefits that uh, cyberspace can provide us. And uh, our agenda and our, our mission is to pr promote the resilience that's needed so that people um, across the world can benefit from, um, from what cyber uh, has to offer. And um, you know, we, we feel it's very important that we don't lose sight of that in the sense that uh, I, I think many of us spend our days worrying and addressing and uh, watching threats and risks that are emerging, but we also have to recognize that uh, uh, with, um, with the reach of cyberspace today, the benefits that it delivers are uh, not, not a nice to have, they are must have. And uh, they, they really do act um, to be able to promote that development and that shared prosper prosperity across the globe. Um, very quickly, our project, as I say, EU funded, uh, we have three primary implementation partners um, which are the Republic of Estonia and the Information Systems Authority, um, the British Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs from the Netherlands. 
And together, these implement, implementation partners support our efforts, but um, we very much rely upon um, expertise from across Europe to be able to um, deliver our various initiatives and interventions um, wherever we can find the right expertise and the right capabilities um, to support our efforts. Um, briefly looking at, at what is it we do and um, how do we seek to engage. Um, we, we work with partner countries really in three primary areas. The first of which is the obvious um, one around incident response and um, cybersecurity incident response capabilities, uh, building up those um, both for um, uh, environments where there may not be a, a CERT or a C-CERT in place today, but also very much working with uh, uh, those C-CERTs that are underway, but are um, seeking to further mature their capabilities, uh, further grow um, both their capacity, but also um, uh, their integration into the international um, cybersecurity community. Um, a second area of focus is, lies in the one that, uh, again, Elizabeth described above in the sense of the national strategies. And um, here, we, we don't seek to uh, uh, in any way, you know, dictate or advise strongly what a national strategy uh, must contain, but rather um, look more at the practical side of implementing a strategy. Um, we all know that um, uh, it takes an awful lot of effort. It takes an awful lot of collaboration and cooperation to see a strategy and a national cybersecurity strategy adopted and reach that important phase of uh, cabinet approval. Um, but often, um, uh, we, we then worry about what next? How do we get this strategy implemented? How do we actually um, uh, deliver on that strategy and reach the goals that, uh, uh, that, that the strategy sets out? So we seek to uh, engage with partners very much on the practical aspects of implementing strategies. I, I, I'll, I'll step back slightly and say, while well, while not um, uh, you know by by not necessarily uh, suggesting um, major content of na national strategies, one thing I think we do recommend is to uh, um, try and try and keep it as um, uh, as balanced and as manageable as possible because. Um, uh, often, you know, in other fields, we've seen wonderful strategies develop that are very difficult to implement um, because they are so far reaching and so broad. So taking things in, uh, in uh, logical and prioritized steps uh, sometimes is the most manageable way um, to see these strategies progress. Um, a third area of focus is uh, one which, you know, the, these sessions um, are very much a part of, and that is building up the um, uh, communication and cooperation of um, cyber professionals uh, from across the continent. And with that, uh, uh, getting, getting the lines of communication and cooperation open across the globe. Um, there was uh, an interesting comment made, made just earlier by Engineer Badar from, from Oman, where he spoke about the importance of one-on-one -on -one connections. Um, and this is something that we strive to support, which is building those relationships between um, those individuals and those, uh, those um, experts or, or technicians that sit and have to deal with um, uh, risks and threats on a daily basis, getting them connected with their counterparts um, in other nations or within other certs within their country um, to be able to build those levels of trust where information can be shared. 
Um, we, we really do believe in that word trust that, uh, um, you know, cooperation comes from having trust across C certs and um, uh, cybersecurity incident response teams as a whole. And um, the only way to build trust is, is through building relationships. Unfortunately, um, the, uh, the pandemic in the past uh, uh, couple of years now we've faced has really restricted our ability to uh, uh, facilitate face-to-face -face meeting. But I think uh, we, we feel strongly that uh, um, uh, as we progress and hopefully find our way uh, back to uh, our new normal. Our new normal will also include um, us being able to have um, just these types of events face to face, where individuals can uh, build relationships, can meet people, um, and can, um, uh, with that, go back and be able to reach out in the future, knowing who it is and and uh, who it is they're engaging with and have that level of trust um, as they move forward. Um, so I think I've, I've already used up all my time just uh, uh, through an introduction, um, but uh, I think uh, I have a few points that I think we'll, we'll, we'll get to uh, when we get to questions. So uh, uh, Sharif, I'll, I'll, I'll hand it back to you and uh, then look forward to uh, uh, fielding some questions. Thank you. Thanks for sharing, Nick. I uh, really appreciate all your points. Uh, uh, building trust is key. We'll get back to that later. I'd like to move to our next panelist, uh, um, uh, Mr. Jeremy uh, Kittengam. I hope that I got your name correctly. You are, uh, you know, uh, you know, very much welcome to join in the discussions, uh, following up on what already has been. Uh, covered. Uh, Jeremy is with the UK Home Office. Please, uh, Jeremy, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, thank you, Dr. Sharif, uh, for that introduction. And thank you to um, Africa Cert and FIRST for invitation to this event and, and to all our, pa our participants. So uh, I'm going to also try to share my screen, um, but I will keep it brief um, in the interests of time. So hopefully everybody can um, see my first slide there. So just by way of an introduction, what I want to talk about um, today is uh, an initiative known as uh, the African Commonwealth National Cyber Risk Assessment Initiative. Uh, this is a program that is sponsored by the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, and it's delivered by the Home Office uh, International um, Cyber Team. So the the focus of this project is to really help countries to gain an understanding of cybersecurity risk at the national level, particularly to critical national infrastructure and essential digital services. And uh, more importantly, to be able to use that information to help drive cybersecurity capacity building and ultimately to help to mitigate those um, national risks. So over the last uh, three years, we've been working with uh, the African Commonwealth countries. Uh, we've been working with countries on an individual basis um, to help run those uh, national cyber risk assessment projects and gain that understanding. And also we've worked with the African Commonwealth as a community via our um, annual uh, capacity building conference where we bring together representatives from uh, the African Commonwealth and we focus on capacity building under a number of headings, um, you know, clearly with our focus on national risk assessment and CNI, uh, we focus on CNI protection, uh, but we also focus on strategy and policy, particularly looking at how assessments like a national risk assessment, but also a maturity assessment like Oxford University's capacity maturity model assessment, how those insights can be brought together to help shape strategy and, and policy. As part of our work across the Commonwealth, we've also um, gathered a view of where capacity gaps are most acute and some of the requirements. 
And that's led us to focus in a number of areas. One is about skills, and we've already heard about that. So, you know, raising the skill levels and particularly looking at diversity and inclusion as a key plank of, uh, you know, improving uh, the availability of skills within any country. Uh, looking at cyber attack exercises, which I know have already come up. So running uh, tabletop virtual cyber attack simulations and how important they are and how that's a capability that every country can um, benefit from. Uh, and we've looked at countering cybercrime because that emerges as a major concern for every country. And we look at, at threat intelligence as a key tool um, to help us with that insight. So uh, because our focus is on national cyber risk assessment, I thought I'd just spend a few minutes giving a bit of context to what we mean when we talk about national cyber risk assessment. So we're really talking about a, a strategic national level assessment and it fitting in with an overall top-down approach that might start with a national view of overall risk, then factor out the cyber element of that risk and then continue in a top-down approach that helps develop an understanding of that cyber risk in the context of national risk and then use that to help feed the capacity building actions that will follow on from that. So we promote a very top-down approach, um, working from a national picture and a national strategy and policy on, on down. Uh, in terms of why we've got this focus on uh, risk assessment, it's because we believe it's a critical part of the jigsaw puzzle when it comes to understanding how to improve cybersecurity and focusing on CNI and essential digital services is a core part of, of pretty much every country's national cybersecurity strategy. Um, so understanding risk in terms of impact and likelihood, understanding dependencies, which, which is a theme um, I might come back to, um, and looking at what constitutes the likelihood of a, of a cyber attack. So looking at threat vectors, looking at uh, vulnerabilities. And then the whole point of the exercise of conducting an NCRA is to combine all those insights into a, an, uh, an analysis and a report and recommendations that can drive capacity building. So um, I won't dwell on this one. We've already touched on a colonial pipeline. Cybersecurity attacks to the critical national infrastructure are escalating and becoming more and more of a concern to all of us. It wasn't always the case, but now it's very much an area of, of key concern for all of us. Um, so protecting our critical national infrastructure is important. Uh, pretty much every piece of modern critical national infrastructure is underpinned by an information system, hence cyber is important. Um, sectors like communications and utilities cut across every other sector, so dependencies are really important. And unless we understand what are the systems that make up our CNI, then we'll find it very hard to defend those systems and, and add resilience to those systems. Um, so we recommend a cyclical approach measuring the risk picture um, through a survey, analyzing the risk picture, using that to prioritize where to focus scarce investment effort. And then the, the fourth and most important stage is to feed that information into action plans, programs, and projects. And that's basically the essence of our National Cyber Risk Assessment guidance. We look at threats and threats need to be um, tracked all the time. There are trends. Uh, we're seeing a lot more supply chain attacks, so we need to constantly track those attacks. Understanding the capacity building capabilities that are going to make most difference is important. So mapping that risk picture onto where we can invest. So things like risk management within CNI organizations, training, asset management, incident management. These are all important capacity building headings that you can map the insights of a risk assessment into. Risk itself, we use the standard model um, for risk and we gather information on impacts at that lowest level. We provide tools that then calculate the various aspects of risk. This allows us to reduce the overall risk by mitigating impacts and reducing likelihood and taking actions at that lowest level there. So just to give an idea of what does an analysis look like, this is your standard impact and likelihood grid. The numbers in there are illustrative of the number of systems across all sectors that we find at that level of risk so this allows the immediate sort of categorization and the red highlighted systems there. You know, it shows that in this illustrative example, there are four systems at a likelihood of five and an impact of five. So these are critical systems that really need urgent action to address. So that's typical of uh, the insights that come from a national cyber risk assessment. Obviously, you can drill down by sector and, and conduct various analytical views. Um, 
just a few um, sort of highlighted best practices. Uh, we have found that taking a very broad view of impact is important. So considering things like national reputation, we aggregate uh, components of systems up into coarse grain systems that deliver essential services. That's how we break down CNI into a manageable set of systems. We believe it's really important to understand national and international dependencies because our supply chains are so much more in interconnected now and becoming even more interconnected. Um, and the final slide there is just a summary of what we consider the best practice. Very happy to uh, make these slides available. Um, but in the interest of time, um, I think I will stop there. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Sharif. Thank you, Jeremy. You, you really um, shared with us a very lively presentation. I really appreciate this. You touched upon a, you know, quite a few important points uh, when it comes to critical national infrastructure, recognizing them, coordinating efforts, the interdependencies. You touched upon interdependencies. This is really critical. Uh, you know, failure in one of the infrastructure can result in just not you know, affecting a specific sector, it can have a ripple effect. So that's a very important aspect of looking at things. Having assessment at different levels is also important. Uh, uh, you touched upon supply chain attacks and advanced persistent threat without even uh, using the, you know, the, the APT acronym, mm -hmm. but, you know, this is a pattern of uh, cyber attacks that we are seeing, uh, I mean, recently I've started seeing more of, and unfortunately we anticipate more of it uh, in the, I mean, the days to come. Thank you very much again for sharing. Now we have our uh, final uh, presenter for, the, uh, for this panel. Uh, uh, Palitiam uh, Asi from the uh, Tongolese uh, uh, National uh, CERT. Uh, actually, it's uh, um, you know uh, very important to have uh, incident responders from uh, Asi CERT being with us, and I really appreciate you um, sharing with us your experiences as it applies to regional and international cooperation. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Sharif, can you hear me? Uh, I hope I got your name correctly. I, I did my best. Yes, you did, you did, you did great. Palakian, so you did great. Thank you very much. Thank you. I know it's not the, the, the easiest one, yeah? So, so thank, thank you very much. Uh, th thank you once again to the team, to, to Af Africa CERT, to TuneCert and to FIRST, you know, inviting us. Uh, we are very, 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 very proud of being part of this pan panel with this, um, uh, such a great panelist and uh, giving us the ability, the, the, the opportunity to talk about, uh, you know, Togolese initiative. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, the slides are in French. I'm sorry about that, but I'm going to speak English and, um, and I'm happy to take any questions, you know, in French or in, or in English about it. So, so no issue. So um, the idea is to uh, describe the, the international in initiatives that we had to take in place in, that we have to take in Togo to build effective, you know, operational framework for, for our cybersecurity program. You know, how to build uh, effective uh, CERT and SOC, you know, uh, you know uh, how to, to build effective incident response capabilities and protect uh, effic efficiently, you know, our critical infrastructure. So uh, in Togo, we decided to do it via uh, a PPP so public partner, public private part partnership, and I'm happy that the colleague Elizabeth Vish talked about you know the importance of public private initiatives. So uh, I'm going to just describe here today what we've done in Togo. So my name is Palake Masi. I'm the head of CERT TG, so the National CERT of Togo, and the technical director of uh, Cyber Defense Africa, the uh, company created by Togolese Rep 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 Republic, sorry, to uh, handle cybersecurity initiatives in Togo. So. Uh, I'm going to describe quick, quickly the challenges of cybersecurity that we had to face to explain why we had to put in place a public-private partnership and the first results that we're having so uh, so far, so quickly. And I'm uh, try, I'll try to get into the, the the time slot that I have, meaning the the uh, seven to ten minutes that, that I have. So sorry if I go quickly on some slides, but uh, no issues. I'm, I'm I'll, I'll take the time to respond to the questions. So um, the challenges of cybersecurity that we had to face in Togo, you know, the, the Togolese Republic has a strong uh, 
development plan based on di digital. As a matter of fact, 70% of our uh, five-year plan of development, 70% of the projects are really re rely on a, on a digital plat platform. Yeah, so uh, fortunately for, for us, that gave us the, the to discuss the importance uh, that gave us the chance to discuss the importance of the importance of cybersecurity into that uh, that that pro program. So uh, we had an urgent need to protect, you know, our critical infrastructures, uh, our public institutions, and and uh, and 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 the citizens, right? Because all all these uh, uh, public initiatives are impacting the citizens directly, right? So uh, we had the, the urgency to uh, pro protect them. Um, we also had the financial uh, issue, right? Uh, cybersecurity is, uh, is, is, is uh, quite an expensive pro program. So we had to uh, find solutions to, you know, on how to finance it and how to finance it uh, on a sustainable way, uh, not only relying on, uh, on pub public funds on, uh, or pub public you know, state fin financing. So we had to find uh, a solution on how to finance our cybersecurity program. Uh, a, a lot of the pan panelists that talked to today, obviously, they talked about building capacity, you know, in terms of technologies, human resources, and so on. So uh, in, 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 in Togo, uh, as many of the African countries and, uh, and as many of the countries in the world, you know, we are limited in terms of resources, right, in terms of hum human re re resources. So that's one of the challenges that we had to face as well. And on the other hand, you know, the, 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 the attack surface is increasing, right? And we, uh, Dr. Sharif just talked about the APTs, right? And, uh, and the, the threats, the attacks that are more and more sophisticated, right? So we, we and when, when, when you compare this to the uh, urgency of protection, you know, the, the, the actors, the, the threat actors, they don't wait for you to be re ready, right? They, 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 they hack you right now, straight, straight away. So we had to do, well, and we had to do quick. And the last point that I want to discuss is as a, as a challenge that we had to face was the lack of trust. You know, in, in our country, uh, the public institutions do not get the trust from the private sector, from the citizens, from the partners and so on, right? So we had to build trust and so that uh, the, 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 the national CERT had the trust of all these entities. And at the same time, we wanted to be, you know, uh, not only build a CERT, but build one of the best CERT in the region. You know, we, we, our, the, the vision of the government uh, was to not, not only do it, but do it well and do it the best way as we could. So we had the political will. We had the leadership from the Togolese Re Republic, from the head of state to all the ministers involved into that, into that project. So digital economy, security, defense, and so on. Uh, they were all really, really involved into the project. So we had the political will. Uh, we created an, a national agency for cybersecurity, right? It was important on our eco ecosystem. But then we had that uh, decree uh, designating our operators of essential services, so the critical infrastructures, and they had the obligation to protect themselves against cyber attacks, right? So when we seen this, we decided to create a, a company, you know, a private company uh, that was part of the shares were, were held by the state. And this company, we, we gave he, the, this company the ability to operate the national cert, right? So then this company uh, not only will operate the national cert, but we want this company to uh, behave as a private entity, you know, uh, because in our ecosystem, the private sector has this, uh, capability to deliver better ser services, you know, better quality of services than the public se sector. So we wanted really this company to have a private mindset and not only be a public institution. So we decided to add to this, uh, to, to the role of this company, the ability to operate the national SOC and this service would be pro provided to the critical infrastructures. So now, we ended up having a company that will operate the CERT, the national CERT and the national SOC. And this, this mo model gave us you know, uh, uh, synergies. We created syn syn synergies uh, in terms of resources, in terms of finance, 
uh, because actually we use the same resources for the CERT and the national SOC, uh, where the goal is to pro 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 protect the critical infrastructures. Now, uh, for the financing issue, uh, we decided that the SOC services, so the security for the, uh, for the uh, critical infrastructures would be uh, paid by, by, by actually the private sector, right? These critical infrastructure, they would have to pay for the services for uh, pro pro protection. And then we will use this money that this company is, is, is having to operate the CERT. You know, so we found we we actually found a way to finance our cybersecurity uh, by the private sector, and then we have uh, we 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 decided to bring in a private uh, partner, which is uh, Aseco Data Systems, a Polish company, to help us build this company, uh, because then we would uh, you know use their track records, we would use their their their, their processes, we will use their quality of service to provide the best in-class quality of service to uh, the, the, the private sector. And this actually helped us as well to, um, you know, have a, a, a knowledge transfer and transfer of technologies and all that done in the best way pos possible because then our interests were aligned, right? It's not only a provider uh, delivering services or trainings to another, another to its clients, but now we created that company together so the transfer of knowledge and the transfer of technologies are done from uh, partner to partner, you know, uh, uh, be, be because we built this company together. So let me present you the structure of the project uh, really quickly. So you have uh, Togolese Republic and ASECO. Uh, so Togolese Republic holds 68% of the shares of that company and ASECO has 32% of the shares. It's really important because this is how we control our so sovereignty. 68% of the, sh the shares is what is required in Togo um, to have the control of the company. So we can take any decision we, we want without the private partner, right? So we, just, we created CDA together. We have the national agency of cybersecurity and Togolese Republic is issuing you know, laws and decrees and, and, and all you know, the reg regulatory frame framework. The ANSI is delegating some services, you know, uh, all, all, all the technical services to Cyber Defense Africa. Now, all the technical and operational activities are done by Cyber Defense Africa, this company created uh, by both Togolese Republic and ASECO Data Systems. ASECO Data Systems is helping Cyber Defense Africa and Togolese Republic actually to build, you know, capacity. We actually had. Uh, uh, you know, support from, from, from a bank. And this was important because by doing so, we do not impact on the state finance. We do, we, we do not rely on the state, you know, money to actually develop our cybersecurity program. So now we have a sustainable model, right? And we are able to de deliver the set services, non-profit, -pro obviously, free for all the citizens and uh, everybody that needs to, you know, uh, that needs help to respond to its incidents, we are here to help. And we develop services for, you know, a SOC client as well. And, and then that's where we get getting paid. And that's where we get the money to, you know, pay the, the bank. So this is the model that we have stru structured in Togo to, uh, you know, develop our cyber security program. So quickly, I will not waste time on on this slide, I talked about it. Uh, Cyber Defense Africa is a PPP between Togo and ASECO Data Systems. And I will go uh, on my final slide, uh, presenting the first re results, right, that we've uh, experienced so far. So uh, our journey of cybersecurity started in December, 2018, where uh, we released the, the law on cybersecurity and fight against cyber, cyber crime. So basically, to 2018 and 2019 was the regulatory framework, you know, all the laws, all the decrees that were necessary to put in place uh, the cyber structure in the, in, the, in the country. So end of 2019, we created Cyber Defense Africa. And the, the, the real, you know, the technical story started re really in 2020 when we, we, when we recruited the whole team, the technical team of CDA, and we started the journey. 
you know that 2020 was also a, a big event in the world named COVID-19, um, but this did, did not, you know, uh, um, uh, impacted us as, uh, as, as such because 2021, we were actually, you know, fe February 2021, we were actually able to launch officially the CERT TG, so the National CERT of Togolese Republic. So uh, we designated the, the first operators of essential services in Togo in January 2021, and we uh, started protecting them, in, you know, you know uh, if, if efficiently starting from March 2021. So the CERT TG as of now, uh, they deliver a couple of services, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, regular services that CERT provide, you know, uh, handling of incidents, respond to incidents, uh, awareness campaigns, uh, audits, you know, uh, and so on and so on. And we also do, you know, the, the, the forensics in partners with the law enforcement here in Togo. Um, that's, you know, the, on, on the CERT side and on the SOC side, we provide a lot of services, you know, paid services. So in Togo, right, as of now, we have a, 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 a company that belongs to the Togolese Repub Republic cap capable of handling efficiently, at least we, we, we're working hard on it, to uh, help the critical infrastructures to protect themselves. And uh, the money we are get, get, get getting from, this, uh, from these services are actually invested in the, in the CERT, and, um, and that's the model that we've put in place in Togo. Thank you very, very much, Sheriff, and I hope that I did not, uh, uh, you know, uh, exceeded the, the, the time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We really appreciate you sharing with us a quite a unique experience, the experience of the Togo uh, National uh, CERT, uh, in, in my view, in my you know professional view, based on experience over 20 years in cybersecurity, is quite unique. It has uh, elements of you know public-private partnership that is you know worthy of recognition, as well as one thing that you didn't mention, which is your CERT is 100% nationals. Uh, so it's operated by uh, Togolese, I mean, only. It's, it's really nice to build, you know, on, uh, you know, unique partnership with other, you know, uh, I mean, outsiders, foreign nationals. At the end of the day, you build 100% uh, uh, Togolese, I mean, uh, uh, national uh, cert, uh, serving both, uh, you know, private sector as well as the general public. And you've done this in a, a challenging time of the pandemic. So it's worthy of recognition. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, I think we come uh, at, I mean, uh, to the end of our panel. I'd like to thank all, uh, you know, the panelists for such, you know, a very distinguished and special comprehensive presentations. I hope that this panel highlighted what we promised to highlight in terms of, uh, you know, the importance of regional and international collaboration to face cybersecurity challenges. Uh, I, we have had experiences from uh, different panelists from different backgrounds. Um, I look forward to more discussions throughout the day and the coming couple of days, the trainings. And I, I think this is a very important step forward for Africa and the Arab region and with our partners from across the globe. Thank you very, very much. And um, I pass the floor uh, to Tracy to take us to the break. Thank you very much.